I'm going to start out by saying something that's going to sound a little bit odd. Forty years ago, the man that was instrumental in my becoming a commercial beekeeper gave me some advice that I've never forgotten. He told me that the beekeeper's calendar year starts in August, and that what we do from that point forward sets the stage for success in winter and spring and beyond. Uh, he told me that before the mite problems we have today even existed, and so I would say that today it's even better advice than it was back then. Yeah, these That's things a nice are strong colony there. full of bees, just the way we like it. Now that thing's going to shrink in size over the next few weeks because they've been laying less brood. So all of those uh, worker bees are going to disappear. That big strong colony is probably going to trim on down to six to ten frames of bees within just a few weeks. So all we want to see is some sealed brood. There's a lot of honey in these, a lot of pollen. If we see sealed brood, we're happy. We want to make sure they're queen right before we invest in the treatment. We're putting three apivar strips in each one. I know that the instructions say one strip per five frames of bees, but as you can see, I think there's more than 10 frames of bees in each one of these, so we're giving them three strips. The worst thing you can do is under treat. That's the best way to build resistance in the mites. So Seth's got the gloves on, so he's putting the strips in. You don't want to touch this stuff with your bare hands if you can avoid it. We just put three strips right down the center of the brood nest. Ideally, you want these strips in the brood. Because there's so many bees in these singles, we actually leave the lid cracked. When we put it on, we don't put it down flat. We leave the, uh, the little uh, strip sitting up on the back so they have a little air space at the back. They're pretty full of bees. Um, it's best to give them a little extra air. Some thin syrup really puts them in good shape. So this yard didn't get fed when we treated it because it was really heavy. We're going to have a look at all the queens, or, well, I should say, we're going to have a look at all the patterns, make sure all the queens are doing a good job, and uh, get them fed up. Okay, let's see what Tommy's got here. Looks like they still have a lot of food. And, of course, that would be real nice sourwood honey in there, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, Yeah, no problem with the food. 
Okay. Pattern. Let me see if I can get over your shoulder. Yeah, that's a beautiful pattern. Absolutely nothing wrong with this queen. No problem there. Just give him a bucket and move on. He's got a few more bees in that one. I wouldn't be surprised if this one has a little less food. Usually if they have a lot of brood when we pull the honey supers off, those end up being the bigger colonies. They're also the ones that are in danger of running out of food before we get back, so we really got to watch it. And this one has plenty of food. I can see that from here. There. Yeah. It doesn't show up in the camera as a lot of brood, but it actually looks pretty good. It looks like it's full of eggs and larvae. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Two gallon bucket, okay. Yeah. And of course what we'll do when it gets towards the end, as long as we're on a bottom board like this, we can just reach down with our hand and heft the box and see how heavy it is. That one definitely needs more. It's not that heavy, it's, it's moderate. So the reason we're looking at these queens, this whole yard is full of queens that were produced in April. I guess it was late April, early May. And somebody would say, well, why are you worried about it? Well, just because a queen is uh, only a few months old isn't a guarantee that she's going to be doing what she should be. I'd say 5 maybe 10% of all queens really don't do a good job and need to be replaced before the season's over. And also, if you have old queens from the previous year, you really need to understand that... Uh, a queen becomes middle-aged by the time she's a year and a half to two years old. And even though she might be doing a really good job right now, that, that's not an indicator of what she'll be doing a month or two from now going into winter and especially next spring. This yard has something else going on that's kind of interesting. This bank and all around is covered in kudzu. Kudzu does make a little nectar. When it's blooming like it is right now, it smells like grape knee high. It's really interesting. I'm going to walk over there and take a close up of the flower. If you were to drive by it, you wouldn't see the flower and you'd never know it was flowering. I'm surprised at how many local people don't even know that it does flower. A lot of times the flowers are hidden under the leaves. Yeah, it just smells just like grape knee-high around here. You can see the flowers kind of tucked away behind the leaves here. It's about halfway over. It's got a little life left in it. I don't know that they get any pollen off it, but they definitely get a little nectar if the weather's right. And they are this year. A couple of the yards we were working this morning were doing a little robbing. This one is not. They've got a little minor honey flow going on on this kudzu right now. It's the 16th of September, it's a Wednesday, and we were in this yard exactly two weeks ago. I just looked in our little record book that we keep on our yard visits. It tells us when we were in a yard and what we did there. Uh, at that time, they got their second check um, since we pulled the honey supers off around the 1st of August. At that time, uh, when we pulled the sarwood supers off, we put apivar strips in and treated them and uh, I think the strips are still in these colonies and we're going to take them out today. But uh, every time we come, we do kind of a little uh, minor inspection. The last time we were here, we really opened them up and checked on the brood patterns and how the queens were doing. This bucket that's on here now, which should be empty, was one-to-one -one syrup. We uh, made it just a little heavier. That was two weeks ago. That would have been um, uh, September 2nd. And today, anybody that gets a bucket is going to uh, still get one-to-one -one syrup. And it, it, if you look at if this yard carefully, you'll see some got buckets and most of them did. Some got a one-gallon bucket, some got a two-gallon bucket. The ones that were fairly heavy, we just gave one gallon because we want to keep them working a little bit. We want to keep them stimulated a bit with that sugar syrup. 
If they got a two-gallon bucket, that meant they were lacking in weight a little bit, and we, we, of course, gave them more. Now we're starting to think a little differently. Now it's time to start thinking about what we want to be finished by the middle of October. Um, some of these that only have a one-gallon bucket might get s switched for a two-gallon bucket now because we're thinking in terms of what they should weigh by mid-October. Um, I often get asked when I speak at bee clubs, how much should I feed going into winter? And I tell them, if your box doesn't feel like a box of rocks, you're not done yet. And we also uh, try to tell people to have their feeding done before the cold weather sets in. Sometimes that's hard to accomplish, but we really try to do that. In our neighborhood, that means mid-October. I have had to feed in November before. Um, if I was feeding in November, I'd probably be using two-to-one syrup because I want to get them heavy fast. Um, but if I've done my job right, uh, we got them heavy enough by mid-October, and we did that with one-to-one -one syrup. The reason I'm using one-to-one -one syrup, or perhaps as heavy as 1.5 part sugar to one part water sh uh, sugar syrup, is I want them to treat it like uh, ne incoming nectar and add the enzymes that they typically would be if they were um, processing fresh nectar. I think that uh, makes better winter feed and I think it's uh, uh, the right thing to do as long as you have the time to do it. Um, I've been watching some of these guys up in Canada, uh, specifically Ian Stepler, get his colonies ready for winter and I believe he's been feeding something that's about two to one syrup and uh, his window of opportunity is much shorter than ours and he also has these massive clusters going into winter which we do not. Uh, our colonies have been shrinking through attrition for some time now. Actually, we don't really have much of a pollen flow in July, even when the sourwood honey is coming in. So our brood nests have been shrinking since July. That's why we try to, to kind of backfill the brood nest incrementally like this. I really don't want to put uh, a lot of weight on them fast at the last moment. I want to take uh, all that time through uh, August and through September and into the uh, early October to uh, progressively get them get them heavier. We don't want to shrink the brood nest too soon, but we still want to keep them stimulated with that thin syrup. So um, it takes a lot longer to get them heavy, uh, of course, if you're using thin syrup. But that's okay because we need to take that 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 long duration of time to do it. Keep them keep them working on something, so to speak. So uh, that month and a half of that dearth in August and early September is behind us now. The goldenrod and the helianthus is blooming wide open. They have a really good uh, heavy pollen flow coming in right now. So uh, now's the perfect time to start getting them heavy for winter. That combination of pollen and one-to-one -one syrup uh, being fed uh, uh, helps them continue rearing brood for the next two weeks and then the, this pollen flow will be over by early October and if we still don't have enough weight that'll be the time that we might choose to feed uh, that uh, thicker syrup 1.5 to 1 uh, just to get them fittish for winter. Anyway we're here today to check these out. We're going to uh, just heft the colony, see how they feel. If something's a little light it might get a two gallon. If it's uh, uh, mediocre it'll get a one gallon and there might be some in here that are rock solid and uh, ready for winter and maybe not get any more feed at all. Anyway, that's what we're about today. So. Well, we can see that most of these colonies got a two gallon bucket and uh, I'm pretty sure that most of them will get another two gallon bucket before it's over. I just spotted this little patch of asters near the bee yard. Bees love to work aster. They actually get a little nectar out of it. A little bit, a little bit of pollen too. Aster usually starts blooming at the tail end of the goldenrod, uh, although here it seems to be just a little earlier than that. The nectar off of aster is not considered premium feed for winter because it has a tendency to crystallize quickly. In our neighborhood, there are two varieties of aster. This is the blue one that blooms earlier and then the white one that comes later. I think the bees do much better on the blue one as far as getting pollen and nectar. And they work the white one later because there's simply nothing else to work. Here's a nice stand of helianthus. And there's a number of varieties of helianthus in our area. Um, it's a wonderful pollen producer. It's in the sunflower family. Bees love it. 
we're just down the road from our bee yard and I see a bunch of our bees in it. Um, they get a lot of pollen off of it. It really helps them get ready for winter. Seems to be high quality pollen. Um, the locals just call it native sunflower. It's not a real large flower. I don't think the bees get much nectar off of it, but they sure do get a little, lot of pollen off of it. And they're all over this stuff. I see hundreds of bees out there. We were here exactly two weeks ago, and then we were here, I think, almost exactly three weeks before that. Um, they still had lots of pollen in the comb, so we didn't feel like we had to give them any pollen substitute or anything like that. There are years when we do that, if there isn't any pollen coming in or isn't any in the comb. The apivar strips have been in, uh, well, they've been in five weeks, so about five and a half weeks. I'm going to go ahead and take them out. I think that's long enough. As you can see, they've got a lot of space left in these outer combs. Yeah, they have all the room in the world for... This one could probably take five gallons of that one-to-one -one sugar syrup. This is a very, I know the camera won't pick up what's in the middle. It's full of young larvae and eggs. This is a beautiful frame of brood. This pollen flow plus that last bucket of thin syrup has really stimulated, stimulated them into rearing some nice brood. They look real healthy. This colony, if this were a dog, I'd say this dog has a really good coat. This is a healthy looking colony. You want to see that really pearly white larva in there. Lots of pollen. This colony is making a lot of that uh, helianthus and goldenrod. This is a good looking colony. This thing in there, they actually I can see the eggs in here if I, if I get it just focused just right. Queen's doing a wonderful job. Looks really good. This is going to be one of those colonies that will be ready to split right on time next year. Part of my investment isn't just about getting them through the winter. It's what I can do with them in the spring. These colonies are what makes my living. I got to have good colonies in the spring, so we try to do everything just right. This is a nice colony. Yeah, that's a nice colony. They'll go into winter in really good shape. I just need just need some more food. I'd say five gallons of one to one will do it on this one. This was the one that weighed 62 pounds. It's not near heavy enough. Yeah, very nice brood. Just exactly what we want to see in the middle of September. As we go further through the month, uh, the brood nest will begin to diminish uh, dramatically and in two weeks when the pollen flow is over they'll really uh, shut, start to shut down laying. Most queens will be done laying eggs by the second week in October and that's only just a little less than a month away and that's the time when we want to get that final bucket on them and get that extra weight on them just before uh, October when it starts getting cold. This is a great looking colony. This will be a nice colony. They should overwinter fine. 
I just need about four gallons of syrup. We had some uh, some queenless colonies at the last yard and some pretty heavy boxes of honey, really. So I'm going to give, uh, we showed up with about six boxes like this and I'm going to put them on the uh, stronger colonies, make them a double deep for the winter. Seeing this old box in this apiary sitting next to this newer equipment kind of reminds me how it used to be in the old days when I first started beekeeping in southern Oregon in the early 80s. I had a lot of this kind of stuff. It's all I could afford. Um, Hand-me-downs and just kind of scraping the barrel for anything I could get my hands on to build an outfit. This box actually reminds me of a fun story. Uh, in the early 1980s in Southern Oregon, I met a man by the name of Niles Benson. He was a retired beekeeper that had had a career in Southern Arizona. When he retired, he moved to Southern Oregon, I guess, just for a change of scenery. He was 85 years old at the time, so I guess that means he would have been bored before the turn of the century, before 1900. He would have been one of those beekeepers that got to experience the golden era of beekeeping way before mites when things were really good in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Anyway, he was a part of the local bee club there in Medford, Oregon. That's where I got to know him and one day invited me over just to check out his bees and have lunch and I took him up on that. He was a really neat old guy. He was full of information. We walked out into his backyard and uh, right off the bat I could see that his equipment was atrocious. It was even worse than this. After a few minutes, I couldn't help myself. I had to make a comment about it, and he kind of snickered and looked at me with a mischievous grin and said, you know, Bob, the, the bees don't care, so why should we? He's actually, he was actually kind of right, because it seems like sometimes your best colonies are in this old junky equipment. I honestly think it has to do with these extra entrance holes and everything, all these places they can come and go. Um, in the winter, I think that creates a place where moisture and condensation can escape. I know that can become an issue in, in equipment that has migratory flat covers. Some people will put a little stick right there, lift the back of the cover up in the winter to let condensation escape. It doesn't take much, just a small little stick will do. If you get too big of a crack there, it'll create a draft and create an airflow in there, which is not what you want. Anyway, I bought this box in Texas about 25 years ago. Made a trip over there and picked up some used equipment that was already 10 or 15 years old, so I guess that makes this box 40 years old. It's made out of cypress, which is pretty good wood for beekeeping. Um, it shows no signs of rot. It just looks like it's kind of in rough shape because of its age. That green box up above is pine, and it didn't get treated with anything for rot, and that's what happens with pine right there. That box is only six or seven years old. Uh, treating pine for, for rot resistance is actually the subject of another video. Anyway, seeing this old equipment is kind of like looking at a blast from the past for me. Thankfully, I don't have much of it around anymore. I can afford to have nicer stuff. Anyway, bees don't care. This colony is a laying gone laying worker. It's just a mess. You can see all that uh, protruding brood right there. That's a dead giveaway. When you look in the cells, there's multiple eggs in the cells. It's just a mess. People ask what I do with that. It's pretty simple. So let's go over there. This is a good, strong queen right colony. Just put the whole box on there.
That just stopped any fighting. There won't be any fighting for a few minutes with that mess. By the time they're done licking each other off, they'll all be sisters. We were just in this yard a few days ago. This is an interesting yard. It's really deep in a hollow in western North Carolina. There's very few people up here, which is really the way I like it. The bees do well here. We made a really good crop of sourwood here this year. Um, this yard has a couple of unique things going on. For some odd reason, I have the potential to have a lot of mouse trouble here. They like to get in my battery box that charges the bear fence. I was chasing them out of there. They like to chew on the wires and destroy things. So once the weather gets cold, they're looking for any place to hole up for the winter. That's one of the reasons I like to use 3 8 entrances, because a mouse can't get through 3 8 of an inch. If you use a 3 quarter inch entrance, they can walk right in, and you need to use a mouse guard in some circumstances. Um, another reason I like the 3 8 entrance is because you get less burr comb between the bottom bars and the bottom board with a 3 quarter inch entrance. You get a lot of that. I, I call it... Uh, ladder comb honestly and uh, the bees have to have something to climb up to get into the box once they get in the in the bottom board anyway so they've had three rounds of buckets of syrup and uh, judging by the weight we felt here the other day I think they're going to need one more the double deeps in the yard will probably get two more I like them to be extremely heavy too Sounds like a lot of syrup, but uh, remember, it's just one-to-one. -one. We like feeding one-to-one -one when we can. We have the time to do it. Uh, we're not uh, constricted time-wise, and we really take, uh, I guess, two and a half months to do our feeding before winter, so I like doing that one-to-one -one syrup. This is a nice patch of goldenrod. This goldenrod, along with helianthus, is really important for us to get our bees ready for winter. High-quality protein is uh, important for those winter bees. They have a different physiological makeup than the summer bees. Their fat bodies are different. They have to live a long time, so they have a different makeup. Nothing replaces Mother Nature when it comes to high-quality protein. We do use pollen supplements at different times of year. Um, in a dearth year especially, we might use some in August and late July to keep the bees brooding a little bit. And this year they had plenty of pollen in the combs, so we didn't have to worry about that. We just fed some sucrose syrup. <clears throat> Yesterday I had 48 colonies in this bee yard. We sold them last night. We've already sold about 700 colonies this fall. We do that every year. I think I sold about 800 last year. and. I hope to sell a few more this year. I'd like to sell 800 this year, too. Just like selling nuke cycles out frames, selling beehive cycles out equipment, when you replace it, you're kind of putting in fresh stuff. It keeps your outfit from getting too old. I've had this bee yard for about 25 years. It's a really neat spot. I like it. Uh, right over the weeds, you can't really see it, but the Tallulah River is right back there by that bank. It's a fairly good sized river. Um, we really like eating lunch here in the summer on a hot day. It's really pleasant to sit by the river. I can hear it, but I don't think the microphone will pick it up. Anyway, this is a really nice bee yard. 